So at the time I was 10 years old. I was a fourth grade school student. We were about to have our final exams uh, when, uh, when war was declared. From the morning, from the dawn, uh, you could see these American war fighters taking over the skies and leaving a trail. That's what I distinctly remember. All these trails in the skies, which otherwise would have been quiet because uh, of um, the isolation of the regime the preceding five years. So uh, as soon as the those jet fighters started taking over the skies of Kabul, um, uh, we knew it was time to to run for safety and we, my parents thought it was going to be our home province. We left Kabul, I remember packing everything in this one huge truck. I also, a, a sense of adventure as well, it's, it's, it's quite crazy but I was I guess young enough uh, for what was about to happen because whatever was the status quo was going to be you know, turn on, turned on its head and we were quite, people my age, we were quite aware of it. I'm Mujib Obed. I live here in Brisbane, originally from Afghanistan. Um, I'm an academic, a researcher at the University of Queensland. Welcome to Get Your Armies Off Our Bodies, a podcast by Wage Peace. We're glad you could join us. I'm Zelda. We can all hear the war talk getting louder, the drums beating, as they say. It's not an accident. War is big business. Australia is massively expanding its very own military-industrial complex, and weapons companies stand to make billions. We need a new peace movement to face this. And that's what we want to share by introducing you to some of the people we work with and some of the people we admire, and by shining a light on the companies driving this weapons bonanza. I think you'll like our friend Mujib. He's joined Wage Peace at several events in the past. It's been quite the journey from Afghanistan way back in 2001. We went back to Kabul so about four months later. A lot of, like... Fundamental changes. For one, you didn't see as many bearded men in the city. They could shave their face or they could trim their uh, their hair however they wanted to. The fact that people could wear Western clothes, tiny, um, uh, you know, specks of freedom, which were really clearly messed and mourned by a lot of people. So the first thing that completely stood out to us, and we talked about this on and on and on because we thought it was fascinating. But the number of teachers who, just like the months preceding, had completely turned themselves into um, a Taleb fighter, a militia person, massive turbans, big bushy beards. Now the same people had cleaned themselves up. They were wearing proper, I would say acceptable, gear to come to school. And their attitudes had shifted quite fundamentally. No longer were they carrying massive lashes and, uh, you know, uh, means of corporal punishment. All of a sudden, we could joke with them. They could connect, actually, as human beings. Um, Female teachers, some of whom I still remember distinctly, I had brilliant relationships with people who absolutely inspiring figures who had themselves were as excited to be back because they had been relegated to a home life against their will, some of them more more even a decade. Now they're back. Just a a, a fascinating time of uh, of hope, of longing for, uh, you know, a permanent break from, from, from the previous, by then, 26, 27 years. You have within the wars uh, Operation Enduring Freedom for Afghanistan, Operation Iraqi Freedom for Iraq, uh, the freedom narrative, the idea that what the United States is doing in those countries is helping them stand up their democracy. We are uplifting. We are, uh, through force, beating back the savage, the uncivilized, uh, the heretical, 
and bringing them a new way of life, a better way of life. Hi, I'm Matthew Ho. Uh, was in the Marine Corps for 10 years, uh, State Department as well, took part in the wars in Iraq uh, and Afghanistan, resigned in protest over the escalation of the war in Afghanistan in 2009. I'm now a fellow with the Eisenhower Media Network. Actually, Matthew Ho does a whole lot more than that. He's on the advisory board of World Beyond War in the US, as well as Exposed Facts and Veterans for Peace. He also ran for the US Senate for the Green Party in the 2022 midterm elections. So I joined uh, the Marine Corps in January of 1998. I was out of college and I was working for a publishing company uh, doing finance for them. And there was, an, like I guess to describe it as an existential angst that I had that I was going to be doing not serious things with my life, that I want to be part of the big hand movement of history. I wanted to, you know, when I reach uh, later in life, I could say, uh, this is what I had done with my life. And I had done serious things and I had done things that had mattered. Uh, you know, people may say, well, that, that, why would you think the U.S. military was the way to, to do that? And two things kind of factored into that. One, my dad was a firefighter growing up. And uh, we used to have my birthday parties at the fire station. And so I, I think you have that personal aspect. How do I live up to what I grew up with, seeing my dad being a hero? How do I be a hero? And what you saw the American military primarily doing uh, in the 1990s was a lot of humanitarian assistance. You know, if maybe things went badly, like what happened in Somalia, but it was all dressed up as going to help people as going to intervene to try and put things in order, to try and protect the weak against, you know, some form of evil chaos. And so I had a very Pollyannish and naive and, 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 and stupid, if you will, worldview. Yes, I think I was sold on the idea, the liberal promise, let's say. You know, I was 17 years old and before you know it, I find myself inside the Ministry of Defense getting trained in, uh, at their uh, network operation center, which was basically managed by Americans or their contractors. Paid $300 a month at the time, which was to me a ton of money. Um, this is 2008. Basically what I did was fix their internet, make sure they had internet connection, uh, make sure they had email connection, printers. Um, I was also very excited to be making friends with Americans and NATO soldiers who were stationed there as advisors. One's name was Jeff, I remember. Uh, Jeff was a dear friend of mine, and he would always invite me over. And, uh, th there was a degree of mistrust, which at the time I couldn't quite read because I think I was too young. I don't know how exactly human relations in professional settings work, so I would just barge in always thinking this guy is my friend. I think uh, me being an Afghan, it didn't matter how friendly I was or how much I could uh, throw Hollywood references and, you know, at the time I had to take into watching Friends, the TV show, you know, we would talk about things like that. But I think deep down there was a degree of mistrust um, from their side that I could sense even back then. After his stint at the Ministry of Defence, Mujib studied at the university, worked in the NGO sector and worked for private contractors. There was uh, these the sort of like Americans who had originally come to Afghanistan um, wearing a uniform. They go back home and then they come back and this time it's all about money. And well, where do you make money? It's how do you best situate yourself to, to profit from the military industrial complex? Uh, they were actually transporting goods to American bases uh, and and. and sort of camps across, dotted all across the country. Places like Camp Agers had certainly hundreds of trucks on a daily basis. And you would hear of incidents like trucks being burnt down or drivers getting killed or um, kidnapped and, um, because all the roads were basically very insecure. Um, and then obviously the response was hiring private security firms. But then those private security firms were equally as bad, if not even more so, than the transportation company that I was working for. Um, the lack of accountability and transparency 
I, I saw it with my own eyes. I would experience it on a daily basis. Um, our boss was this American guy, f f you know, formerly uh, army person. Um, he had a pistol and I would notice that the holster is kind of, it has like a little clipping that goes on top of the uh, pistol. It's unclipped and I noticed that it looks like the gun's loaded uh, and ready to go. Uh, some of my other friends are noticing it because, you know, uh, he comes there often, frequents our office often. So finally, they come to me like, Mujib, you're friends with this guy, Eric. Can you please go and talk to Eric and, and see if he, something could be done? Because we all feel unsafe. And I remember going there to his office and talking about something else. And at the end of the meeting, like, I have one other thing I request. Can you please, when you come to our office, can you make sure that the holster is clipped properly because we don't feel safe? And he just basically looked at me straight in the eyes and said, if anybody, including yourself, have any issues with me ensuring my safety, well, just pack up your stuff and leave and don't show up in the morning. Um, when he was driving between uh, various compounds, um, he would have his pistol loaded and he would place it on top of the steering wheel as he was like, sort of driving. It was all about if anybody makes any sudden movements on this street that he frequented, by the way, like on a daily basis. Yeah, he was right there, uh, loaded and ready to, um, to shoot people. Um, it, was, it was a strange world to be, to be a part of. Finding myself um, in, in this sort of private, firm sphere uh, where nothing else but money mattered, they would stop at nothing to get more contracts, to serve the war on terror in the most efficient way. Efficiency was of big importance, always emphasized there, to, to, to make money. I'm very comfortable saying war is a business and tying it back um, to the victimhood of my people. Disrupting the business of war is our focus here at Wage Peace. The world's biggest weapons corporations make mega profits from armed conflict. But it's not only the biggest companies. For the global war on terror, it includes many, many others. And you know, the numbers are, 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 are uh, hard to understand, hard to believe because they're so large. From 2001 to 2021, the American government spent more than $14 trillion on war. Of that, the estimates, uh, you know, this is done by the people at Brown University, uh, are that $7 trillion, half of that money, went to weapons contractors, went to consultants, went to private organizations. So you're, you're fitting into that model of outsourcing, of privatizing, of taking what are inherently government functions and letting people make profit off of them. Um, and then the, 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 the glut of the money goes to the uh, servicing contractors, the logistics people, the people who man the chow halls, who drive the trucks. Uh, and you had all these development contractors that made fortunes off of the reconstruction efforts, you know, hundred more than a hundred billion dollars spent spent by the American government on reconstruction work in Afghanistan, uh, about fifty billion or so I think spent in Iraq, and you know a lot of that money never left the United States. You know, uh, from what I can recall, uh, being involved with it, seeing it, forty percent of that money went right to overhead. You know, before it even touched any of the program costs. Um, you know, so it was a racket. And you have people making just obscene amounts of money on these contracts. It goes well past the executives in the, 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 the boardroom. Uh, it extends all the way down to what you would call normal people. And that sustains the war. You know, I mean, it, it's a good thing for these people. They're, and, you know, I mean, that's why it keeps going. Just one famous example is Halliburton. The company founded by Dick Cheney, US Vice President at the time the US invaded both Iraq and Afghanistan. In Iraq alone, 
Halliburton received 39.5 billion US dollars in government contracts related to that war. Across the board, we're talking vested interests and personal ambition, people, organisations and systems that depend on the wars. And one of the key ways to keep this going is, naturally, to control the story and the political perception of what's needed. General McChrystal was in charge of the US military campaign in Afghanistan in the early part of the Obama administration. When General McChrystal in 2009 does his assessment of the war in Afghanistan and is going to come back and tell President Obama, this is what needs to happen in Afghanistan, who does he have do the assessment? He doesn't have the Pentagon or the CIA or the State Department do it. He brings in think tank people. He brings in contractors to do the assessment for the war. And of course, what do they say? Oh, you need to surge to victory. Who funds all these think tanks. The weapons industry does. And of course, they mesh because these are all people that want to be at the cocktail parties with General Petraeus and, and others, right? I mean, so you, you see the megalomania here that is underwritten by the money. Outsourcing is also about avoiding political responsibility. Most people are familiar with the fact that the American military had 7,000 soldiers killed in the Iraq and Afghan wars. 8,000 contractors were killed in those wars. And these are all men and women that in previous wars have, would have been wearing a uniform. They're driving a truck and the truck hits a roadside bomb and the contractor dies. Nobody hears about it. The killing and destruction went on in Afghanistan, Iraq and so many other places. But the world's biggest weapons companies actually made most of their money selling to other places, not to those wars. Let's unpack this a little, just to see something of how complicated the military-industrial complex actually is. The nature of the profits uh, 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 of, the, of the major defense contractors, the weapon makers, your, your Raytheons, your Lockheeds, uh, your Boeings, those come from things that weren't being utilized in the Iraq and Afghan wars. Um, their profits come from systems. Their co profits come from bomber planes and ships. I mean, certainly... Uh, you, you, even with, with, they make the bombs that our planes drop. But in Iraq and Afghanistan, well, in Syria, we, we, particularly 2015 onwards, we drop a heck of a lot of bombs, but that's not going to, that doesn't make money like the weapon systems do. So the biggest weapons companies might make much more money selling to Saudi Arabia, for example, or to Australia. That doesn't mean they didn't also make large profits from Iraq and Afghanistan. It's just not their biggest business. Where the major weapons manufacturers will get involved is they have subsidiaries who do a lot of the contracting work, the services work. So you may have a, a firm that is providing translation services in Afghanistan or a firm providing uh, 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 food services in Iraq, and they are a subsidiary of the major weapons corporations. Uh, but also, too, they also did sell, uh, you know, uh, drones. The, the, the drones that bec have become ubiquitous over the last 20 years are, are you know, come from these companies. Uh, but what you had, too, was just a, 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 the spirit of Washington, D.C. was such that anything the military wants, it's going to get. And we're going to give it more. So that's been, that's been the spirit of the last 20 years is that whatever they want, they're going to get. So the wars helped them because there was no saying no. There's no saying no. The weapons makers make the war stories and the war stories say, we need more weapons. The companies get more and bigger contracts to make more and more weapon systems. And in this kind of story, war sells itself. The military industrial complex is a perpetual war machine, which means perpetual terror for communities living in the impact zone. We were all staring at it, this moment of truth. This fear of something bad going to happen at the moment of this force that we are escaping from, at the moment that this force manages to catch up to us. So for us, it was always the fear of the suicide bomber or the so-called complex attack, where a couple of people would come take over a housing complex or a military install, installment or, or whatever. Now imagine living like that, 
for uh, let's say 15 years especially the south and the east of the country at that time they had to worry about the drone strikes the what they call chopa which is the night raids which were absolutely at their most horrendous uh, sort of a decade and um, the um, IEDs are basically um, causing a lot of collateral damage. Uh, we lost a lot of people in my village, actually, young people. Kids who I knew, who I, I went to school with, or who were younger than me, in fact. And I would see them play around, uh, us, the younger ones, and others who were the same age, age, age uh, as us, and we would go play ball or... Volleyball is one that we were really into. They were subjected to rather cruel treatment by both sides of this conflict. Some of them had turned to the insurgency and picked up arms. Others were, uh, at least from my understanding, forced into doing things for the local insurgents. Uh, there were rivalries. Like there's this one incident, okay? Um, uh, it's between a distant cousin of ours, a young boy who was actually, I just remember distinctly, he was a good three to four years younger than me. Um, he, he had uh, turned to the Taliban and picked up arms. Another of his classmates had become a police officer. So, um, so they had some sort of a disagreement. Our distant cousin, he goes to that friend's home, knocks on the door, calls for his name, comes out, shoots him right there on the spot. Then some time goes by and he is discovered in the district center by the colleagues of the boy who he had murdered, who were also police officers. Well, they tied him to, uh, on, uh, to this Ford Ranger vehicle that the police were assigned and they drag his living, breathing body until there is no more life left in him. in the main street of the district center. Another kid who we, we called him Kolohak, which means a piece of clay. For some reason, that's the name we had. He was this chubby, tiny little boy uh, who was uh, very playful and a little mischievous. Years go by, I don't see him. We hear stories of their family, they are struggling. He got blown into pieces along with a bunch of his other teenager friends because they were planting an IED. Because this affected me so much, I asked for more information and kept talking to people about it. First, he's a child, so how culpable he could be. But more than that, uh, there is a likelihood that he might have been um, forced into doing this. You know? Uh, and I think as incidents like that, visceral, um, happening to people who you knew from the playground, through family, from functions and community gatherings, I think it eats away at your very soul. This is a kid that I knew. They were boys who I were my, my friend. Then over the years, you see them. They are being killed. This cannot continue. Something has to give. You, you, you knew you were being lied to. You know, the torture was becoming clear you know, of what was happening at Abu Ghraib and, and what was occurring at Guantanamo Bay. And of course, my head, words like mistakes rather than crimes were how I viewed these things. So getting to Iraq in the spring of 04, uh, my thoughts were that, well, I can do good around me. If I don't take these Marines and sailors to Iraq, some other guy who's not as good an officer as I am is going to go, and he's going to get them killed. And I'm going to bring these kids back. You don't want to let people down. You lie to yourself. You believe that somehow you're going to do it differently next time. You're going to be better next time. Thinking that I could be moral within such a circumstance as war 
And no, you cannot be. You become an agent of that war's immorality, no matter who you think you are. So by the time I get to Afghanistan in 2009, as a State Department officer, as a political officer, I'm morally and intellectually broken because I'm going there hoping that somehow the war in Afghanistan is fundamentally different than the war in Iraq, and it wasn't. And I knew that, but I lied to myself about it. After seeing that for enough time, dealing with the dead, uh, you know, seeing the casualties, uh, particularly among the Afghan people, something broke inside of me. I couldn't lie to myself any longer. I was suicidal. I saw myself as a piece of meat. That's when I resigned in protest over the escalation of the war by the Obama administration in 2009. And yeah, here we are 13 later, years later talking about it. When I, when I finally contacted the Washington Post and I want to write an op-ed uh, saying why I resigned and why escalation in Afghanistan is wrong, we should be ending the war. Um, the Post, rather than have me write an op-ed, they write a profile of me uh, of, of that's front page above the fold. And it's a big deal. And when I said to Karen DeYoung, the, the journalist, a very senior journalist at the Post who wrote this, I said, why did you do this? Why did you write this big thing about me? You know? And she said, because when I talked to all my contacts, when I spoke to people at the National Security Council, over at the White House, in the vice president's office, at the Pentagon, at the CIA, at the State Department, at USAID, on and on and on, she said, no one disagreed with you. Everyone agreed with you. But no one was willing to say anything about it. And so I, I think what we had was that for years, we all knew that the freedom narrative was just nonsense was just was just a false was a lie a lie that allowed the war to continue because you're constricting what can be said about the war what can be done about the war certainly when i was in, in iraq the first uh year I, I remember you were not allowed to say the word occupation there was like the absurdity of it was such that uh american forces were not allowed to have american flags on their vehicles because it would look bad we would look like occupiers. I don't know why the, the, M, the, the 50 cal machine gun or the, or the 40 millimeter grenade launcher that's on that vehicle doesn't make us look like occupiers, but the flag is gonna do that? Sure. I mean, that was how strong the narrative was. It allowed otherwise intelligent and uh, uh, professional people to ignore the fundamental reason why they were killing us. You couldn't speak that because that is heretical. That's blasphemous. We're talking about stories as control. That's not just stories told in the media and so on to manage public opinion. It's also the stories that control the people who are inside the system. Those are maybe even more critical. Institutions have to enforce these stories internally if they're going to function. The military perhaps most of all. And they have powerful tools to do this. The strength and power of groupthink is, is well known. I mean, it's, it's there's there's a societal evolutionary reason for it, right? I mean, there's some amazing studies out there that show the power of groupthink. And institutions, of course, do everything they can to enforce groupthink. Everything from you know you know uh, clamping people with golden handcuffs, uh, right? You know, where like it's financially irresponsible of you to leave. Number of people who said to me, both military and civilian, CIA or State Department or USAID, who would say to me. Uh, I wish I could do what you did, but I got a couple of kids going to college in a few years. You know, golden handcuffs are real, but it's also too the the, the danger of being ostracized. I, I didn't have anyone I was responsible for. I didn't have kids, didn't have a wife. So if I had a translator uh, or interpreter that was like my guy that I was responsible for, I probably wouldn't have done it because I probably would have that used that as an excuse to stay there. Like, I can't leave these guys. I can't abandon them. And when I quit, I quit. By 2021, Mujib was studying in Australia. In Afghanistan, the Taliban was capturing more and more territory, including provincial capitals. And the US was preparing to pull out its troops. Worried for his family, he returned to Kabul to help them get out of the country. By, I think, the first week of... Uh, August, we had we had gotten the visas, but then by then, because of the rapid pace of the fall of not just at this point, 
districts, but also provincial centers into the hands of the Taliban, the neighboring countries, one after the other, closed down their borders. Um, so I ran out of time. Really, it was it was that simple. We all did. We got. I was as trapped as everyone else in the family. From the morning, uh, rather the midday that Taliban entered Kabul, there were Taliban prisons in our neighborhood, like basically right underneath our building block. So it was quite something to to see that. Um, not knowing what what would or could happen and a couple of days in oh i got an email from canberra because i have an australian passport i got the email saying that you need to get to this spot at the airport i got on the phone with them i was like does this mean you just want me or my family because i'm here with my family and i cannot abandon them they were like, no, it's just for you. I was like, well, it's not happening. I mean, I say it like this right now. At the time, it was a lot more dramatic. I went to the airport. I tried on three different occasions. Um, the, the three times, every single one of them, I think I experienced things that nobody should ever experience. Being in either of those gates near the airport, seeing tens of thousands of people running for their lives, trying to get on one of those planes. Losing any hope of me or any of my family members really ever quite making it through the crowd and through the shooting and the chaos. But as all of this was going on, I had friends here in Australia who, who had realized I was there. Uh, an entire community at Sydney University, my research supervisor at Sydney University, and my research supervisor at the University of Queensland. And then others, friends, people who our paths had crossed it was so uplifting. As a, as a migrant, you go through life sometimes, and there are these moments of crisis where you, you wonder whether you've touched enough lives, whether these relationships that you, you, know, you, you formed, sometimes you pour your heart, heart and soul into it, whether they have substance. And for me, it, it had to be this moment of crisis that had engulfed not just myself, but my whole family to remind me that those relationships were actually deeply meaningful and that we had indeed um, touched it, uh, each other's lives in a significant and meaningful way. Mujib's friends got busy doing whatever they could. One had a family connection to former Deputy Prime Minister Barnaby Joyce and Mujib answered the phone one morning to find Joyce on the line. Others harassed the office of then Shadow Foreign Minister Penny Wong until staff pleaded with them to stop calling. They were totally clear on the dangers Mujib faced. A couple of days earlier, a dear friend of mine, a, really a childhood friend of mine, who had managed to get to the airport with his wife and their tiny baby, he had sent me a message. It was a screenshot of a WhatsApp conversation. And in it, there was a detailed description of getting to the airport through a uh, route that hadn't yet been really made so public that everyone knew about it. I said, we're going we're gonna to take this route and see what happens. And it was a totally like different um, meandering, zigzagging kind of road through uh, like these tiny alleyways and streets. We made it. And we made it without encountering a single Talib or militiaman which was totally the opposite of my experience the previous three times. And they flew us out of Kabul in a plane that had no windows to look back onto Kabul as you were being evacuated, which is somehow something that stuck with me. Um, and two hours later, we landed in, in Dubai in a, in a military base. 
there was obviously relief because of the safety that that was there. But you have to understand, I have critiqued the war on terror, the Western project or intervention in Afghanistan. Um, I have been truly invested in the camp that says there is an inherent injustice to what's being done to Afghanistan uh, in the name of curbing terror, but in fact propagating terror. Now here I am with my family, with little ones, my parents, um, on this steel tube that was the instrument of the very killing and the maiming and the destruction that I have critiqued for years and years and years. Uh, and I'm being saved by them. It gets you thinking. It, uh, it continues to get me thinking. And we are all implicated in it at some level this terrorizing system. You know, the traumatic brain injury I have and, the, uh, you know, I wasn't able to work for five years because of the nature of that, the, the debilitating uh, uh, migraines I would have that would last for up to 18 hours and I'd be, I mean, completely unable to function, you know, in, you know, the pain and everything else and the, the awfulness of that. I would take that any day over the week, any time over the moral injury. You know, that's what drove me to being suicidal. This aspect of moral injury, of, of realizing the narrative's not true. That, and not only that, you're a perpetrator. You didn't just accept the lie. You didn't passively go along with it. You took part in it. And even after you knew it wasn't true, you didn't have the courage to do anything about it. And there's a breaking point. And now all these years later, you know, that moral injury has developed into a soul-breaking psychosis that the distress is so great that suicide seems as if it is the only answer. And this is why you have so many suicides among combat veterans, it is this moral injury where you, when you transgress, when you go past your own thresholds, your own values, and whether they be religious, ethical, moral, spiritual, wherever those come from, when you... Uh, not just defy them, but when you desecrate them, it really is a, 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 a torture, a destruction of your soul. Yeah, I looked around and I, all these emotions, these mixed emotions were taking me over in this plane. Joy, euphoria, angst, disgust, disappointment. <laughs> to myself and uh, I, I looked around and my own phone had died I think uh, I took my little kid brother's phone and I wrote a little poem and a verse of that is now hanging on our wall difficult as it might be uh, humanize the demon from whom you have just escaped. This is Get Your Armies Off Our Bodies, the first season of Peace Pod. Produced on unceded Aboriginal country on the continent known as Australia. Production credits and other links are on the episode webpage. I'm Zelda, and we're Wage Peace. Wishing you all a future of Earth care, not warfare.